I'm not even gonna in, I'm not even gonna add an introduction because that's just how I fly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fly Jason, fly Jason. <laughs> so here we are. Um, it's been a couple of weeks, and um, we're back with um, Rabbi Sky back uh, it's after his um, amazing vacation um, to have another chat about one of the misconceptions or myth conceptions of Judaism, and uh, this is a uh, this is a subject that you proposed um, on intermarriage. So maybe you can kind of give us the statement that we're going to discuss today. Well, I think that uh, one of the, the sentiments that we have in the world today um, is that, uh, you know, any kind of taboo of intermarriage is smacks of racism. And, uh, you know, I think this is one of the misconceptions or misconceptions about Judaism that I think is widespread, that uh, it's not just racist when it comes to this prohibition of intermarriage, but uh, it's racist when it comes to concepts such as the idea of the chosen people. And so uh, the title I would give to this segment would be, you know, Judaism as racism. Is that is that really true? Um, so I, I think that, you know, the, the more... Um, the, the, where, the, where the rubber hits the road, where it really seems to affect people, is when it comes to the question of intermarriage, meaning the, the idea of the chosen people is more of a theoretical thing, and uh, it doesn't necessarily touch people where they live, in their pocketbook and in, you know, in, in actual um, life. But when it comes down to you know, relationships and who we are allowed to marry, you know, that's where often... In, in Practically speaking, you know, you get a lot of uh, blowback and a lot of, uh, you know, negativity. I, I happen to, unfortunately, because of my work, deal with this on a daily basis when, uh, you know, Jewish parents, um, you know, who n didn't necessarily uh, raise their families in a very connected way spiritually um, now find themselves with their children marrying non-Jews, and it bothers them, it irks them. And so I'm regularly put into the middle of families that are being torn apart by this issue, and <clears throat> I have to sort of harken back to my early days when I was a teenager, and I used to argue with my family about this topic, and I, that was my uh, complaint. I said, you know, this is racism, because, you know, Basically, it sounded to me as an idealistic teenager, you know, who was interested in having love and peace and world unity, that this over-concern with um, preserving the people and the national, it sounded like nationalism and um, it was very, uh, you know, almost, uh, well, I guess racist was the way it seemed to me. And so <clears throat> I think that uh, it's worth exploring this issue because it really comes up so frequently. I'll say that I, from from my perspective, I can totally see where you're coming from now. But more than that, I can see where you, where you, where your thoughts lay when you were a teenager. It's it's a hard sell. The idea of because what for me I, it kind of feels like you're cutting love out of the equation as well. That you're that the capacity to meet the perfect person is kind of wiped off the shelf in favor of meeting the right person for the progression and preservation of a people and that i think that's going to be a hard sell for a lot of um listeners who maybe weren't brought up to be um religiously jewish maybe or weren't or aren't aren't jewish at all it, it is a hard sell and that's why i was super interested in how um this conversation was going to go today um, <laughs> because, because uh, you know, it's kind of, I mean, it feels a little bit like we're trying to um, sell a toddler a horse pill and it's going to be very difficult to swallow. Um, but then on the other hand, on the other hand, I, I, I do, I know your point and I can, I can see, I can see the point. Um, so I think we'll just, we'll just jump in. And what, is it fair to say that in general, um, a Jewish boy or a girl are free to marry who they like. Would that be fair? I mean, there's not. It might not go down well. It might not be a popular choice. But I mean, there's no. Um, 
armed guard at the front door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, when, when parents are raising their kids, you know, parents have a certain degree of authority and control while the kids are at home and their their children. But, you know, once someone, you know, reaches maturity and they, uh, especially, you know, they leave their parents' house, um, they're really free to, to do whatever they want. They, you know, the parents can't control what they believe. You know, parents can hope, um, let's say parents that are committed to Judaism, they can hope that their children will uh, accept those beliefs and integrate those beliefs into their lives, but they can't demand it. They can't expect it as a, as a right that they have as parents. You know, parents, you know, try their best to inculcate their values into their children, um, but at the end of the day, people are free to um, believe what they want and to do what they want. So parents can have hopes and expectations that their child will marry someone that you know, that they are happy with, but it's the child's choice. And, uh, you know, that's sometimes, I think, hard for parents to accept that, you know, that they don't give up their parental authority after a certain amount of years. Um, you know, parents would like to be able to maintain that, you know, forever. But it's just not the case. People individuate, they become their own people. And uh, so it, it's true that that in terms of the you know, free will that we're given as human beings, you know, we could also say that we're free to choose whether or not to be honest or whether or not to be uh, moral. Um, it's true, it's in, it's in our hands. Um, in terms of what God might expect of us, um, we're not really given, uh, I mean, we're given the free choice to choose, but it's not our ultimate um, uh, it, the the the, the um, utility or the value of what we do is not dependent upon our decisions. Meaning that what makes something moral is not our decision from a spiritual biblical perspective. It's God's uh, will and determination that makes something moral and right. So it's true that that given that we live in a world of absolute rights and wrongs, which are established by our Creator. But our Creator gave us the free will to either follow those guidelines or not follow those guidelines. Um, so, biblically, for example, the Bible prohibits Jews from marrying non-Jews. It's simply, you know, that, that's, that's the bottom line. But even though God has uh, declared that to be His will and His uh, intention for us as Jews, you know, we still... Uh, are not robots, and God does not simply program us like the Stepford wives to behave as he desires. You know, we are given the choice. You know, see, God says in the book of Deuteronomy, I place before you today life and death, blessing and curse, and God says choose life. But it's our choice. You know, we, we're not compelled. Uh, and the same thing with our parents. God would, would prefer and desire that we act in a certain way and live a certain way, and our parents as well. Parents have uh, desires and expectations and hopes for their children, but they, they don't control us. And at the end of the day, once they launch their children into this world, uh, these, these grown-up children then have to make their own decisions. I guess it's the... Um it's it's the world. It's this amazing kind of multicolored, um, multi um, textured place that perhaps uh, puts the the strain on on that choice. So you've got uh, children. I mean, when I when I read Deuteronomy seven and it speaks about you know you should not intermarry with them, that that must have been a slightly easier arrangement because these children would have been brought up within a within a boundary and uh, everyone that they knew growing up would have had the same set of um, rules they'd have had kind of an education and an understanding that they were going to be marrying into um, this uh, group of people whereas these days where you may maybe um, Jews are more kind of um, spread out especially I mean even here in Dublin you know I, I don't think you'll find a street where both of your neighbors are Jewish um, so your children are kind of growing up in a world where these aren't the values. And if you're not taught that as a child, and then it's maybe, um, I won't say forced on you, but maybe the, the, the idea is, is more important in your teens, there will be a kind of a natural rebellion. Now telling their children what to do at 16 and 17 seems a little unfair. 
Well, it's, it's not just unfair, but it's it's really absurd. And it, what usually happens is that 16 and 17 year old people are not getting married usually. And you know, in in my work, you know, I'm really speaking with parents whose children are 25, 30, 35 years old, about to get married. And these are parents that really never took, um, you know, faith seriously. They never really, um, it, it was never, you know, living according to the will of God and the values of the Bible were never really the focus of their lives. You know, Judaism for them was usually a culture and a tradition um, and an ethnicity. Uh, you know, th their values were really usually more in line with just regular North Americans than with Jewish values. Um, you know, but they happened to do certain Jewish things because it, it was traditional in their family. So, you know, I'm speaking about, you know, people who may have grown up and have gone to Hebrew school um, as a rite of passage. And then once they had their bar bat mitzvah, you know, their education stops Jewishly. Um, their families may have gathered for Passover Seder, which was really basically a family meal. They may have lit Hanukkah candles. But, you know, these are all cultural trappings of Judaism, and it was never really part of a comprehensive and integrated spiritual life, which was really focused and dedicated towards spiritual growth and growing closer to God and, and really perfecting ourselves ethically and spiritually and morally. So what happens is, you know, these are, we're living in a world where for many Jewish people, their values are not necessarily Jewish, focused on, on Jewish spiritual values. And now they're 30 years old or 25 years old, and they're about to marry someone who's not Jewish, and their parents freak out, and they call me, and, you know, they want me to somehow convince their child that this is really not an appropriate, you know, thing to do. And I say, you know, we have to take the issue here off of intermarriage. It's not the issue. You know, the issue is whether or not someone, you know, uh, is connected to what it means to be Jewish. Uh, I once was giving a lecture at a school, and I think they had asked me to speak about uh, the challenge of Christian missionaries to the Jewish people, and I was discussing that, and then one of the women said, well, this is not really relevant to us. We want you to explain to us why we shouldn't marry non-Jews. And I said, well, you know, your question is a, is, a, is a challenging question, but it's really the wrong question. And I said, I really can't explain to you at this stage in your life why you shouldn't marry a non-Jew. That's really sort of off topic. I said, the real question is for you, why should you be Jewish? I mean, is there anything about Judaism that is totally compelling for you and captivating. And if for you Judaism is compelling and it's profoundly meaningful and it's the center about which your life revolves, then I won't have to explain to you why it makes sense to marry someone who's Jewish and why it wouldn't make sense to marry someone who's not Jewish because why would you want to spend the rest of your life with someone who doesn't share your most deeply held values? And so the question is not so much whether we should intermarry or not intermarry. The question is whether or not um, a Jewish spiritual life is compelling to us and really is something that we commit ourselves to on a serious basis. And really, when you think about this, it, it really dispels the notion of racism because, uh, let's be honest here, uh, when I was dating, when I was looking to get married, I wasn't just uh, eliminating from the potential... Uh, dating pool non-Jews, um, I would equally not have considered dating Jewish women who were not committed to Judaism. Meaning that when you think about it, what's the problem with the non-Jew from our perspective? The problem is they're not interested in Judaism. And so if someone is committed to Judaism and committed to living their life in, in a Jewish spiritual path of growth and connecting with God, if that's really the focus of their life, the problem with the, the non-Jewish partner uh, or potential mate is that this is someone who just has nothing in common with you. And the problem is that that is also the case with numerous Jewish people, meaning there are many, many Jewish people, unfortunately, who have literally no connection to Judaism. And so it's not a, an, a, racial, a racial issue 
it's simply a question of what our values are and what our most deeply cherished uh, goals in life are. And so, um, so it's is it is it more about compatibility, or or is it a, is it about um, preservation? Well, I think that you know at, at the core, it's the question of compatibility. Meaning that it, it's true that Judaism is concerned with um, preserving our nation and making sure that we um, continue to exist. But the truth is, it's that's not our job. Meaning that. You know, the preservation of the Jewish people is in the hands of God. God um, made a promise with us that he would preserve us. He never said that um, there's a guarantee that every single person who's Jewish will maintain that connection. I mean, that it's quite possible that many Jewish people will disconnect themselves from the enterprise of Judaism. Um, so, really, I think that on the deepest level... The concerns about intermarriage are not really for us as, as Jewish individuals. Uh, you know, the, the the concern of preserving the people because that's really not our job. That's the job of God. Our job is to, as individuals, um, responsibly choose who we're going to live with and who we're going to spend the rest of our life with. And if we are people who are deeply connected to, to the enterprise of Judaism and to the goals of Judaism and to living a Jewish spiritual life. It's just common sense that we'd want to marry someone who shares those deeply cherished and held values that we have. And it simply wouldn't make sense to spend the rest of your life with someone who we have nothing in common with in terms of our most deeply, deeply cherished values. And that would apply both to non-Jews and to Jews who are also not connected to those values. And the reason it's not racist is because it's not just a problem that applies to non-Jews. It would apply to Jews as well. And if the problem with the non-Jewish person is that they're not connected to Judaism, that is equally, that's very easily solved if the non-Jewish person becomes interested in Judaism and committed to Judaism. They could convert to Judaism and be a perfectly acceptable marriage partner. Um, so I think that the issue of racism is really a non-issue. It's not really a charge which has any uh, legitimacy because the concern with intermarriage is not a racial issue. It's really a question of uh, what, what our values are, what our life's goals are. You know, this question of whether or not these Jewish values are racist, um, which is often the accusation and the charge that we hear these days. Um, so it does come up vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, this taboo against intermarriage because it does sound racist. And it also comes up when it comes to this concept of the chosen people. You know, it sounds like, you know, almost Jews are... are uh, yeah, they're on a pedestal above everybody else. Yeah, I mean, it sounds almost like, you know, racial superiority. And so I think it's just important to understand that, um, you know, it's, it's not, obviously, it's not a racial issue. I mean, we look around the world today, we have Jews from every race on the planet. You know, we have Jews that are black and oriental. And, uh, you know, you go to Israel today, you see literally United Nations of Jews. Yes, yeah, like a Benetton ad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Railway Skyback, for joining us again. My pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Bye bye.